In yeah. terms of, you know, well, what kind of a future do you want for your kids? Sure. We had, um, you know, one of the most expensive schools in the country that was up in uh, New York. People were paying like $45,000 a year for their kids to go there. And then they found out it was this racist, hateful, Marxist stuff, the uh, uh, diversity, inclusivity, equity type of things and critical race theory that were being taught to their kids. And they were very upset about it. And they went anonymously to a writer to talk about it because they were afraid to go on the record because they wanted their kid to have this name brand school and that was going to put them on the fast track to success in life. But, you know, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Absolutely. So that, that was where their priorities were. And that's what we have to talk to people. That's why this has to be a spiritually discerned and understood thing. It isn't just about the economics here. Uh, it's just like with the abortion thing. You know, you have to take it back and you have to say, well, um, uh, we're talking about a person here uh, besides you. This is not simply about your body. If you're not willing to, to get to that aspect of the debate, if you're not willing to get to the issue of uh, religious worldview, I mean, that, that gets right down to the issue of what is education. Uh, you know, R.L. Dabney said, if you just stick to uh, math and you stick to other things like that, he said, that's not education. That is like a vocational thing. It's like learning how to use a tool or something like that. He said education is really about culture. It's about religion. It's about all these different things. And that's why he advocated that there be a complete separation of education and state. What do you think? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, the, the, these, the, just be very clear. Public schools are government schools, and whoever right. controls the government, uh, and again, that's not necessarily a party thing, although it, you know, it's much worse when Democrats control, uh, but it's not like the Republicans you know, made great strides when they were in control. Uh, you have people who are opposed to God. Uh, in control. Some are light, others are heavy in their opposition to things of the moral order. And when that crowd controls uh, the education or the schools, uh, the institutions where you send your children, how could you ever anticipate anything, any result other than your children coming out not believing? That's, it's programmed for that. Yep. A child who comes out and still has his or her faith is actually a failure in the, in the view of the, of the public education system. And again, yes. it's not just public. I mean, government has complete control there, but many of the private schools have bought into all of this for their own individual reasons. And private includes Catholic schools, but Catholic... Well, they control Christian them through the curriculum. Absolutely they control them through the curriculum. Do. And that's one of the reasons why they created the Department of Education. It did two things. It gave them the ability to set curriculum at the national level, and the Correct. Republicans have uh, been happy to join in with that as well. Mm -hmm. And then it also unleashed all this unlimited money that you get from the federal government, and they use that as a carrot and a stick. You know, well, if you don't put the kids, uh, you don't put the boys in the girls' bathroom, we're going to pull that money that you got addicted to. Sure. So those are really the two things that the Department of Education has, has been about and has done from the very beginning of it. But, you know, as, as we look at this, Michael, that's one of the reasons is we're talking about the how the federal Department of Education has corrupted education. That's one of the reasons why I'm concerned about federalizing um, abortion laws to protect life. I would like to leave this local where we can have a little bit more, you know, more local the better, where we can have control over it because I'm afraid that what we're going to wind up with in a very short period of time, even if you get a majority of Republicans in, in a very short period of time, you'll have, even with Republican uh, support, you'll have some Republicans that will join in with it, uh, they will get back to Roe v. Wade uh, and make it the law of the land. It never was a law of the land. It was a Supreme Court decision, but they will make it the law of the land, and then we'll be in a much worse situation than if we have states that uh, can, you know, Tennessee can protect life. California wants to uh, put itself out there as somebody that's going to uh, come after it. So I, I see the federal approach as being something that, even from a pragmatic standpoint, is going to be more effective because really the battle is for the people who understand, who have the discernment about what life and death and ethics and morality are. And if we can't make that determination, we're not going to be able to fix it. From oh, yeah, sure. I, I, I'd, I'd actually add on to this, David, that I think uh, on a state level, within one or two election cycles, depending on which particular state you may be talking about, 
Uh, I'd say that within five years, outside maybe six years to allow for a final election cycle, I think every state in the country will have some sort of pro-abortion legislation on its books. I agree. When you, when, I agree when, because when you, when we're not doing our job. Yeah, yeah we're not doing our exactly job in terms it. of setting up a moral foundation if you've got a, a completely, uh, not necessarily begins with not immorality, but it begins with a morality, no morality they, that they hold to, right? And, mm -hmm. and once you do that, it, it degrades very, very quickly, as we've seen with the schools and with everything else in society. Yeah, I don't think there's a way, I just don't think there's a way around that. But when, the, when this question is brought forward, and even in these states, you know, they're, you know, red pro-life states, I mean, those are just snapshots of the of time right now most of those states just triggered earlier laws you put the question in front of voters uh today and next year and another election cycle or two in those individual states and that's what the pro child killing forces are going to be doing they're marshalling they're using michigan as an example right now to kind of test what works they did that with kansas Little by little, they will target each of those, I think it's 19 states as we sit here today. I might be off mm -hmm. by the number a little bit, but whatever it is, whatever the states are that, that have somehow restricted or eliminated or completely banned abortion, watch. Every single yep. one of those states will have some sort of referendum be brought forward and they'll go around and they'll start their thing. And within five to six years, all of those pro-life laws will be struck down and gone. And I think a lot of that goes back to the educational system. I Absolutely. mean, you look at what has happened in the explosion and the younger children of even transgenderism. Mm -hmm. That is because of the schools, and you know, and and they will be able to easily do that with the abortion issue because again, it does come back to uh, to sexual license. It's not about liberty, but it's about sexual license to do as you wish. The left and is so good at painting this emotional picture of finding yeah. a victim who isn't really the victim, but finding a victim and expanding on them and then just uh, you know, suggesting to you, well, this poor person needs to have justice done for them. So they can call it whatever they want, you know, woman's right to choose, you know, my body, uh, it, you know, just across the board. Every single cause they do, and they use the media so effectively uh, at this. They, they personalize and emotionalize the issue to such a degree that an unthinking, uncritical public sits there who for decades now has been trained and brainwashed to cry and have a feeling and make their decisions, their intellectual decisions to cast those aside and simply move on a gut feeling. Oh, it's a shame. Look at this poor girl. She, you know, you're forcing her to have a baby. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, oh, look at this person over here. You're, you're forcing them to do that. There are larger issues at stake than an individual case. And yes, some individual cases are very hard, but most of these are not. 98% of abortions are had simply because they want to kill the kid and get on with their lives. So, but you'll never hear that when you're watching NBC or reading an article in the New York Times or the Associated Press or whatever. How fast after Dobbs did the Marxist media find the case of the 10-year-old uh, girl from Ohio who had to go to Indiana yeah. or whichever way it was, all over that, like white on rice. And uh, when Dobbs, when, when the Supreme Court announced this time last year that they'd be hearing the case, uh, I, I turned to some of my colleagues here and said, uh-oh, uh-oh, they're probably going to overturn Roe, or they're at least going to drastically limit it, and they're going to drop that right smack in the middle of the midterms. Oh, oh boy, this is going yeah. to be this is going to be a uh, a certain type of show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know what I well, mean. Well, you know, and, we it's, and it is because the you know the Republicans uh, just cannot speak to the no. true issues, the foundational yeah. issues to it. Well, they don't. They don't, so look, they don't have the, to deal with it. The, the Republican, Republican Party politics. doesn't have a moral founding. It doesn't have That's a moral. Right. There's That's no right. moral. Not founding grounding. There's no moral grounding with these guys. Uh, you know, Haley Barber said in 1992 after the Clinton uh, victory that, you know, Republicans and conservatives have to stop talking about moral issues and, and you know, social issues and values issues and start talking about economics. Because that was, right. remember, the famous, uh, you know, it's the economy stupid campaign. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they really did believe or had the backing uh, or were backing moral issues and Jerry Falwell and the moral majority and all of that. I don't even know that the leadership of the Republican Party was all that down with that anyway. They had to put on appearances. But certainly, mm -hmm. by the time Clinton got in office, the, the Republican leadership just gave up on these issues. They give them lip service every two to four years so they can collect some money from you and you know, they can get a candidate in, you know, because he's better than this child killer over here. But when the push comes to the shove, look, you know, it, it took forever. It took a, 
a, uh, an asteroid to smash into the political scene in the name of Donald Trump, uh, who located this issue with social conservatives and who all be realized very quickly with the Federalist List produced by Leonard Leo and all of these things that if they did not have this was the moment, you were never going to get this opportunity again. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was old, you know, the other, uh, and they needed to, if you were going to make your move, it was going to be now. And uh, so all social conservatives really backed behind him. And in 2016, that was the number one issue in the exit polls. Did you go vote for, who did you vote for? Donald Trump. In the, word, in the world of those who voted for Donald Trump, I believe the number was 26%. The number one issue was to get control of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, mm -hmm. because of abortion. Uh, so, you know, that was it. This was sort of the last gasp that he had to get in there and he had to get control and put a conservative, conservative majority in place uh, so that we could arrive at this. Whether that's going to last or not, I, I, I wish the court would have said, that's a human being and it has the right to due process before you kill it in simply returning it to the states. They should have made a constitutional thing and said, this is it, that's a human being. It's not a human being in Tennessee, but not a human being in California. So you've kind of, I mean, this isn't how, I mean, we used a civil war to finally fix it, but imagine if you just let individual states decide, you know, who can be a slave and who can't. Uh, you yeah, know, it comes you, back you, to the personhood issue. That's you know, exactly but, what it is. And they, the Supreme Court is, should have done that. That's really what they should have done. They've set the stage now uh, by not going all the way uh, of giving the left an opportunity now to hang on to something like they're going to do here in Michigan next month in the election, like they did in Kansas, and like they're going to do around the rest of the place. It's not a state's issue. It's is this a human being or is it not? And if it is mm -hmm. a human being, according to your own constitution, that human being has a right to due process before you end its life. And they, they won't yeah. go that far. That's the problem. That's right. Well, of course, they, they, were, <laughs> they were scrambling to uh, adjust their websites, all these people who are out there bravely in front, you know, cheering all restrictions on abortion and everything. As soon as Dobbs came out, right. uh, they all start scrubbing their websites and, and <laughs> you know, changing everything. It's like, oh no, now it's uh, uh, now we're going to be at the in the middle of this. They could safely uh, talk about how pro-life they were because right. all this had been turned over to the Supreme Court, which I don't really think has the authority to make those types of decisions for all. I'm very concerned about the centralization of those types of decisions. And again, you know, it, it really is going to come ultimately, as you point out, in just a few cycles, even at the state level. Mm -hmm. If we don't have, uh, as if Christians do not come out and set the moral standard then uh, there, it's all going to disappear anyway. The sure. politicians are not going to set the moral standard. Uh, they don't have any morals. But, you know, whenever they, have a, whenever they do have a politician who does start to talk about morality, as you mentioned earlier, they're very quick to say, well, we don't want to hear that. Right. And, and so now what you're seeing now is the label of Christian nationalist, which is being applied to anybody who talks about their faith that is implying that they want to establish a particular religion over and above other people's uh, religious freedoms. So they're doing this against uh, Mastriano and in, uh, in Pennsylvania and that type of thing. But, but he disavows that label, but he talks openly about his faith, and they hate that. They absolutely hate to have somebody in a leadership position who would talk about the fundamental issues of morality and ethics that underlie all this stuff. And that really is what I think this, this label uh, uh, is uh, how they're using this as a pejorative to try to shut people up, to gag people. Yeah, what do you think? I, I couldn't agree more. I think that to it, think about what the, what, think about the, the, those two words. Some of them sometimes the AP when they wrote a story on us and a few weeks ago called us white Christian nationalists. Oh, yeah. So there's of course you got to <laughs> throw racism in on everything. But for the moment, if you lay the race thing aside and look at just religion and nationalism. Why is it so horrible to love your nation? <laughs> Why yeah. do you want your your uh, long-standing, long-held national principles at the forefront of how you govern yourselves? Why is that bad? And the other thing, when you take you know the the label Christian or you know Christian nationalist, and you combine them together, uh, what's so bad about wanting to? Uh, live under a set of principles and laws that dictate 
uh, and lay out the truth that all people are created equally, that they mm-hmm. have equal worth, that they're, that is rooted in the, the creation, you know, the, the dignity they have as, as being created by God, that they have mm-hmm. the image of God within them. What other That's- particular sort of social, moral standard would you govern a nation by? If, everybody yeah. is, if everybody's equal in a Christian nationalism, and yet, so what's the alternative? <laughs> well, these people aren't equal, and these people are lesser, these people are more. I mean, that's really what we're living in right now. Maybe the lip service that everybody's equal, and everybody has equal access to justice under the law, but everybody listening to this knows that's not true. That's not how it works out in, in the real day-to-day world. Uh, that's right. So you know you're discriminated have their, against because you are a patriot. That's right. They have their intersectionality where they they identify certain characteristics about you, and uh, those are either good or bad characteristics. They check the boxes next to them and then give you a ranking. That's the way. <laughs> that's the way it really works in their society.